you know, I completely believe that starting a company right now, or even the last 10 years, it, it, it was a completely romanticized and sensationalized story, you know, where you've got a lot of young and old founders running off to do something because they've been sold this dream that it's going to be this sexy journey that will either succeed or teach them a lot or whatever. It's not. It really isn't. If you find yourself in a situation where you do start something, and that is because it's coming from a genuine place of you trying to solve a problem or to scratch an itch that you just got to do because you know yourself well enough that you've got to do it, great. Um, but for all the other people who are doing it because they're unsure where they are in their lives right now, they're in between jobs, they're getting pushed a bunch of stuff or have been in the past about here are 10 side hustles that you can start or you can start this business in tech or SaaS or sales or anything. Um, I feel like they get sucked into it and they go down a pretty dark and lonely road and they're not equipped with the right, not even resources, but mentality to deal with it. So I guess the, the point of this video today is to at least share what I think are some key qualities you need to, to go down the path of starting a business um, and imparting that experience and wisdom onto yourself, you know, um, and as some context, if, if you don't know who I am, which is fair enough, um, my name is Tashi Dorji. I started a business of my own, gave about six, seven years of my life to it. We hit a $10 million valuation uh, turning restaurants that were closed during the day into a network of co-working spaces. And we did all the right things as young founders, but uh, it ultimately failed. And and yes, we've taken all those learnings and, and we're doing everything that we can in all the different businesses that we work in now, as in the original founding team. But that experience really changed me for the better. But I, nest, I wouldn't do it again. Absolutely not. So... I want to share some of these, I guess, qualities that I think maybe you can think about if you're thinking about starting something, which is why you clicked on this video and you wanted to have, you know, a couple of seconds or minutes with me to figure out what I'm trying to say and see if it helps. The first thing I would say is the fact that you're here, good on you. Like, be proud of yourself. Even if you haven't taken that first step to get started, the fact that you're doing a little bit of due diligence before you just dive into something crazy, I give you credit for. You know, it's very easy to just rush into something and then realize when it's a little too late that there could have been some stuff that you did at the start that prepared you a little, little bit better. Even by taking advantage of educational platforms like, I don't know, YouTube or, um, you know, communities or co-working spaces that you can go join and, and meet other people and, and see if it fits fits what you want to do i think all of that stuff's really important so my, my definition of courage is the willingness to try so the fact that you're trying uh kudos to you now i think one of the first key qualities or principles to take um especially if you're a young founder and i'll get to that because funnily enough harvard business review did a study and it showed that the most successful founders were actually in their mid 40s 45 i believe not to say you can't do it when you're young, but this is also a message for everyone who are in their 40s going, it's too late for me. It's not. There's a lot of stuff that you bring to the table that the younger version of yourself did not have that only time and experience can give. But the first quality I would say is knowing yourself well enough and checking your ego to, to understand the phrase. And it's one of my favorites. It's an Ethiopian proverb, um, which is faster alone, but further together. So as long as you can get out of your own way and figure out, hey, I need a co-founder or I need um, access to a community that I can interact with every day or work with, it's going to serve you really well. And that's what I had to do at the start because I'm a bit of a lone wolf, has, have always been. But when I started one of my first companies, the one that, that hit the $10 million valuation, if I didn't have my business partner or my co-founder, um, I probably would have lasted less than a year, you know, and to be able to acknowledge that even if you could do a bunch of tasks and stuff at the beginning, a lot quicker on your own, because there are sayings and quotes out there that sayings done's better than perfect and blah, blah, blah. And, th and this is kind of 
what I mean in terms of everyone's different and everything's different. So it's very sensationalized, um, starting a business and getting traction and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you can check yourself to understand that even if done is better than perfect and all that kind of stuff, and it's all cont contextual and realize that putting a bit aside a time for a process or someone else's input or working with someone else who might be a bit different to you, it'll serve you a lot better in the long run. And therefore the saying, uh, faster alone, further together. And actually I, I do it to this day still. Um, I work in a large corporate company, a prop tech company that has hundred thousand employees. And yeah, I could do a lot of things a lot faster on my own, but with the team that I have today with different personalities and skill sets, we go a hell of a lot further together. I'll tell you that much. So uh, I, I would say quality or point number one, um, just be prepared to work with people, even if it's at a slower pace, it'll serve you better in the end, right? Um, and that kind of ties in, it's not the point I want to make because you've probably heard it a gajillion times, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. Kind of similar ethos in the sense that find a team and then get ready to go go on it for the long haul. Um, whatever your your idea is or whatever your um, solution is for the problem that you're trying to solve. And if you can acknowledge that it's going to take longer, it's going to be better with a team, that's the first good step in the right direction. And a lot of people don't even really start because they try and do it too quickly to themselves and they don't acknowledge that they need help. So I think that's one of the first key ones that I would really want to impart onto you that served me really well. Um, I think one that is overlooked because again, it's not a sexy buzzword and it doesn't go into a list of the top five or top 10 things that you need to start a business or to scale a company or whatever is frankly education. And there's two ways you can look at that. One is how do you communicate your product or your solution effectively to the mass market? You almost need to be able to describe it to an expert, like, you know, maybe an investor or someone that you're partnering with who really wants all the technical in, in and outs of it, but then be able to explain it very clearly to your grandparents, right? Or to your kids or to someone who's just graduated that may not be as involved in the industry or the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and the reason why that's a part of the education point, I guess, and it's not just about communication and how to do it clearly is depending on what your product is, sometimes it's not just about being able to do an elevator pitch and communicate what it is. It's also about educating your consumer, right? In the right way to make them realize this is a problem that you're solving for me, but also let me do it the correct way. And I'll give you a really good story, um, which I think, you know, helps this point exactly. Uh, we, before another startup that, that I worked on was actually in the condom business, right? And we imparted on the buy one, give one model. So for every packet of condoms you would purchase of ours, we would donate one to a country in need, a developing country through our partner at the time, the United um, Nations Health Development Fund. Funnily enough, it was branded Freedoms because we were big on puns back then. And I distinctly remember, you know, on one of the education trips where we would go to, to a village in Africa and show them how to use condoms, we would kind of take a banana out, we'd roll a condom onto it, and we'd be like, this is how you use it, and blah, 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 because STIs and STDs are quite rampant in some of those areas, and them having access to contraception like this would would help a lot right and we thought we all did a good job it was all great and then fast forward six months and you go back to see how it's all going we found that outside everyone's huts were a bunch of bananas with condoms on top of them hanging outside like it was some sort of relic or sign to help them not get pregnant or spread stds so what we thought was a very clear form of education and we do it in schools everywhere hey let's put the condom on the banana everyone knows how it works was taken very literally um, another example of that was when they were being handed out even by the people who were employed or responsible for distributing uh, said condoms they would staple it onto it like description flyers and literally put holes through them so 
I'm just sharing that story because sometimes you think the most basic forms of products or education or stuff, you just can't, you can't mess up, but you always got to remember, Hey, like you really got to nail it. Right. And, and that was one of the learnings to me where I was like, education is up there and it's overlooked a lot because it's very easy to compress something from 10 sentences into one and think you're done. But I think you really got to pay attention to your, to your consumer or whoever you're trying to help, you know, really listen to them and observe them and everything like that. Um, you know, a third quality that I think is extremely important is it's not luck. And there's sayings like luck favors the prepared and all that kind of stuff. I just think it's being able to take advantage of an opportunity, like really jump at it if it presents itself. And sometimes there's going to be, you know, a little voice in the back of your head or you feel sick on the inside going, oh, I'm not ready. I don't think I should do it. But if it's an opportunity, you know, and you've got big names like Richard Branson in his books and everything that says, say yes first and figure it out later, which can be true for some people and some teams because you've got the resources or you've got the tenacity to figure it out and deliver it. But Again, on the other side of that coin, if you say yes and you do a shoddy job, that brand damage and reputation is going to follow you around. So really think it through. It's more about, okay, here's an opportunity. Have I been preparing all of this time because I haven't just been talking about it or already a year or two into our journey of our company? And I think I can really pounce on this because we've almost been building all of this foundational experience to, to do that. And you'd be surprised. Like even just putting yourself out there and taking that chance, you you won't know where it'll take you. So you, you've got nothing to lose, right? That lesson I learned from my mom, my late mom, because any entrepreneurial bone I have in my body, I think I got from her. Well, actually, I know I got from her. Because um, as an example, she... Uh, She was an entrepreneur before there was even that wanky word going around, right? She was just doing things and trying to figure out how to make money for the family, right? Because, you know, I'm Tibetan Nepalese. She's on the Nepalese side. To put it into perspective, even when she was younger in her 20s, what her and my my auntie Pauline used to do is go into Woolies at the time or whatever it's called. And their idea was fun of fun was to see what new flavors of yogurt were out because they couldn't afford to buy it, but they just look at it, right? And even as an individual, if you're watching this, I think legacy and everything is so important. So whenever you get caught up in too much, just remember where you came from and how much effort your family's put in to put you where you are today or what they've done for you. It really helps ground you a little, right? Because there's times where I'm like, oh, this and that. And I just think about, you know, my mom and my family when they were my age or younger and what they were doing and where where they are today or, yeah. So the story that really stuck with me was we still do a food stall today and it's called the Himalayan Cuisine and it's at Paddington Markets in in um, in somewhere in Sydney, Australia. And, but I think it was about 15, 18 years ago, there were these big music festivals called Big Day Out. And when they would be doing their Himalayan food, there'd be lines and lines of people, right? Hundreds of people long. And you want to retain them. You want to keep them in the light, right? You don't want them to leave and go over to the different food stall because they're like, oh, this is too long. So what my mom used to do is she used to brew chai, which is a type of tea, right? Because she was from Nepal. And she used to brew it and then hand everyone little cups of chai tea, right, in the line. And she always used to do that. And one day they just happened to be I believe the CEO of Gloria Jeans, which is a big coffee chain here in Australia. And when he drank it, he was like, what is this? Because this was before anyone knew what chai was. And then she explained it. And long story short, without boring you for the details, a story for another time, if you're interested about that kind of stuff, though, um, they brewed together a form of chai that was very palatable to the Australian market. And... So she essentially brought chai and launched the chai market within Australia, right? And fast forward to today, unfortunately, we're no longer part of that business because around the time that she got sick and left us was when the tea leaves and everything that we used to brew the chai, maybe it was like 50 bucks a kilo, but that's when the synthetic powder stuff came um, over a decade or so ago. And that was 10 bucks a kilo. 
So without her entrepreneurial jazz or problem solving and stuff like that, you know, that business kind of just fell away, which funnily enough, you know, now health and wellness is so huge again. Everyone's gone already back to the traditional tea leaves or whatnot. So um, hopefully someone in the family will pick that business up again or figure out how they can do it because there is a really nice story there. So coming back, I think if there is an opportunity to take, like my late mother, Mary, um, I think you should take it and just be prepared to take it, right? Don't yeah, don't, don't go crazy, but just get ready. So I think that's a, a third really important quality. Yeah. Um, mm, that one was a bit too real for me. Uh, the... All right, sorry about that. So the Harvard Business Review link, which I'll put in the description, about 45 being the prime age to start a company most successfully... It's really important because if you're watching this and you think you're too old to start something, I really want you to quieten that voice down because reflecting as a former young founder, when I did this almost, you know, over a decade ago, it's like what got me through it back then wasn't experience, wasn't market knowledge, wasn't savviness. It was just this almost ridiculous energy that I had, like a dog chasing a car. And I did it for all the wrong reasons. Like I chased hype. I cared more about press and branding and going to events and all that kind of stuff than actually building the business, which I learned to do over that tenure, that six, seven year stint of building that company. But at the start, it was like, you know, it was the hype. Whereas when you think about it as an older founder, you're way more experienced. You you only care about what you need to. You, you don't really chase the hype so much. You've got it. You've built a network. You're very likely going to start something in an industry that you care about, or you've got a wealth of knowledge about. So there's almost this element of focus that you have as an older founder that you can bring to the table. And it would be a wealth of knowledge and resource for anyone else to tap into. It doesn't mean you can't have young people within your team or younger people, but I would just say, I wish, you know, um, I had someone part of the team who was 45 and wanted to, you know, tackle the problem of co-working with me back then. You know, I reckon we would have eclipsed the 10 million valuation that we had and done way better. And if, you know, I trip over and hit my head and decide to start a company again soon, now that I'm approaching 40, I reckon I'd be way better at doing it now. And all BS aside, it's not because I'm a better version of myself necessarily. It's because... I'm only going to do the stuff that I really care about. I'm not going to get distracted, nor that I have the time to feel distracted, right? And and to close on another saying, you know, if you're too busy and if you if you care too much about what everyone thinks about you and you're trying to get everyone to like you, which is what I did back then, you'll find that you'll end up not liking yourself. So just just do you and find out what problem you want to solve and at least then the drive and whatever you need whatever your soul needs to provide you to to push through that journey and make it work, you'll have like this, you know, ridiculous source of energy to tap into whenever you need to because it's more than just chasing a, a, a silly dream because you think you need to because starting a company is sexy and you want to be able to say you're an entrepreneur at some point. Yeah, not cool. Don't do it for those reasons. So hopefully this video was helpful. Um, and if you found it again, I just want to close on some positivity. If you made it to the end, good on you. Like seriously, good on you. Like it's not, it's not easy as you've probably inferred from my tone and how I talk about this stuff. If you want to do it, great. Good for you. Um, but do it for the right reasons because then when it gets tough, you'll figure out a way how to push through, right? You'll, you'll dig deep and do that. Whereas if you do it for the wrong reasons, it's just going to be a waste of your time, Right. Think about it this way, like all of the content that goes out and gets pushed, the courses, the even like, you know, a bunch of co-working spaces and a bunch of even this video to a degree, if I'm going to be honest, you know, what's the point of that stuff to get people's attention, right? To be able to have an audience to speak to. What What is sexy and trending sometimes? Oh, starting a company because there's all these companies that have started to hit ridiculous bullshit valuations and now are exiting. Um can everyone else do it? Sure, for the right reasons you can, but there's going to be a lot of people who try that 
I'm not saying they shouldn't, but they're doing it for the wrong reason. So I'll close on that. I think it's completely sensationalized, but I think you, if you're going to do this, if you do it for the right reasons and you take some of the qualities I spoke to now in this video, um, good luck. You got this. You really do. And at the end of the day, don't listen to anyone. Yeah. You got mentors. Sure. You got people you respect. Don't even listen to me. Like, who the hell am I? What? Like, and that's the kind of mentality that you need sometimes to just do it. Right. So good luck.